Hey everybody, this is Jeff Peterson. This is the Interstate of Music Podcast. And my guest today is obviously a visually amazing looking human being. Look, I mean, bring in the pipes, bring in the pose, bring in the beard, bring in the attitude, bring in the passion. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Keo, the brand evangelist for Dunlop, uh, self-proclaimed Brandon yes. Evangelist. I'm not sure anybody else is calling you that shit. I'm going to call it. It's on my business card. It, I mean, I mean, when you're, in, that's the thing. When people give you the power to self title, it gets kind that's of it. fun. It gets kind of yeah, fun. Yeah, come on. And so you know, you know what you are better than anybody else, right? So yep. I, I want to, I want to ask you uh, a couple of questions. I mean, you've been, you've been doing this, uh, brand thing for a while you know it inside and out where exactly did you come from in the music industry as far as your passion are you a musician what do you play what you know everything about you musically like what is this what makes you a brand evangelist for dunlop and, and like what's your personal personal world right now well it all started when i was a young boy <laughs> This is a Steve Martin movie, man. He doesn't Total like people. the cans. It's the cans. <laughs> These cans are defective. <laughs> I'm famous now. I'm somebody now. Navin R. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we had the same uh, same movies that we might have watched. Uh, in oh, a that's scary a way. fantastic film. In a scary well, way. In a nutshell, because I don't want to get too crazy. And, yeah, no. You know, we can me. go down the road and your half hour podcast turns into three and a half hours and everyone's asleep. Yeah. But uh, we'd be awake. That's all that matters. <laughs> you know, I had an extra, I had a shot at lunch. She a shot of espresso. The, nice, the nice. whiskey will be later after I get off work. That's Absolutely. for sure. And, hey, and, and, and uh, are you a whiskey guy? Oh, I love whiskey. Yeah. I'm a rye guy. You're a rye guy. So I used to, just so you kind of know, I mean, not that this podcast yeah. is about me, but I'm going to throw it out there. I actually worked uh, I like for it. Jim Beam. Uh, right out Woo! of college for about five and a half years. Um, so I was around when, uh, I mean, I want to date myself a little bit. That sounds awkward to say I date myself. That's weird. Um, <laughs> but I said it, it's already recorded. So I'm screwed. All right. Make it a meme. Woo! So I was around when uh, Jim Beam first came out with the first small batch bourbon uh, of yeah. Booker's. When Booker's first came out. So I was working for Jim I Beam. I remember at that. that time. So then it went into the Knob Creek, the Bakers, the Basil Haydens, and then this whole small batch bourbon Dude. world just exploded. Um, all the fan. names, you, all the names you just mentioned are, are all, all on my shelf. Yeah, they're all on my shelf in my office, and they're not all full. Yeah. I just want to make that perfectly clear. No, of course so, not. So, so, so get to they're not it, on, Hey, hey, they're, they're working. They are not on display. <laughs> That's right. They're a working class bourbon and I'm okay Better with it. Believe it. So if anybody like just wants to send me bourbon, I mean, right. not only will I give you a shout out, I'll drink it. Well, I'm going <laughs> to say this about that. Recently, the knob rye has, has really become a favorite. Really? I like, I like the rye because it's not as sweet as a bourbon. It's a more stringent, and a guy like me, I need, I need to taste the, the poison. Yeah, if being it goes in, down being like in Wisconsin, I owned, I owned a bar for seven years, by the way, just more about <laughs> me. But just by the way, this, Brian, this Brian guy eventually will find out about you. Um, but it's funny because Wisconsin is such a sweet state when it comes to like I love the way they drink. It's like Corbell. You know, the brandies, the sweets, the Canadian whiskeys, which are sweeter. Well, they make Corbell right up the street. Here in California, right up um, the street from the factory here in Northern yeah. California. Man, I went through a shitload of Corbell in my bar. Um, and then the other thing was we call a lot it, of rye. Around here, around here, we call it Cobell. Cobell. <laughs> Cobell. Cobell. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, the rye whiskey, the, the rye bourbons and stuff were bigger um, in Wisconsin just because, like you're saying, it has that sweet Up north. Palette. Yeah, up north. Well, right. Here's, up north. here's my, I'm going to give you my quick whiskey dissertation. Hit me up until up until uh, uh, prohibition, and, and especially at, uh, uh, up until prohibition, the number one whiskey in the United States was a rye whiskey. So when you see the cowboys drinking bourbon, they were actually we were drinking rye whiskey. Post uh, 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 prohibition, and especially after World War II, 
the corn crop was subsidized by the government. So it's cheaper and, and more readily available, the corn, than, than, than the rye. And that's why bourbon is more popular in the States. In Canada, they still, rye is the number one. Absolutely. I love a man that knows his history of what he drinks. Liquor. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, Liquor. you know. Liquor history. So, Liquor. so I, this is a, the last thing I'm going to keep in that whole liquor industry world. If I ever decide that I'm going to go out in the backwoods and start doing moonshine, I need, Whoop. I want you to be the dude that tastes it, but also runs it. You like, you should be the guy driving the car, like 120 miles an hour at, at three in the morning, trying to take those cases of moonshine in the back and get him to that you would be my guy you would well, have the first of all i got i got I the want, beard for you it you got everything everything about you screams my reality tv moonshine you know moonshine runner like what whatever car you want to drive but it's got to be fast and and quiet there was loud. a <laughs> there was a movie in the 70s called the great american hero are yep. you familiar with this movie? Yes. Starring yeah. Jeff Jeff Bridges. Yeah. And it's all about, I think it's Jimmy Johnson Jr. And he was a moonshine runner. Yeah. And that basically what he did at, in North Carolina is how they started NASCAR. I love I'm not even kidding you. I love I'm not that. even kidding you. I love it. I am I mean, not. I, I think that we should like NASCAR once a year should go back to its roots and like create some kind of a track through through the backwoods and everybody should have to like legitimately have like cases of moonshine and you can win but if that shit's all broken in the trunk you lose <laughs> right? i guarantee you they do that somehow yeah, somewhere they're probably doing that. They probably to. yeah there's no way i just came up with that and it's not already been done that's why I'm, I, I, i'm a hundred air and not a billionaire right well i'll tell you what dude <laughs> when you tra like travel around, I don't know if you travel around. I travel sure. around a lot. And when you go down south, you be careful with that moonshine, bro. That's not nothing to be messing. That's not that's nothing you mess around with. <laughs> no, it's it's an that ass. That shit kicker. is strong, that's and that'll sure. knock you on your ass. Oh yeah, yeah. Can I say ass on the broadcast? Ass. It's a, well, it's it's you already said ass, and and we're not going to. As long as I'm referring be... to a donkey. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Absolutely. All right. This are all of a sudden turned into one of my most favorite podcasts ever. I haven't done a zillion of them, <laughs> so don't get super cocky on me, but like right. this is this, I'm pretty good with it. So, okay, good. Musically, who the hell are you? Like, do you play well, anything? Do you, what, yes. what's, what's your deal? I have been a touring guitar player for over 30 years. Touring? I got a, I got, yeah. I did so, some recording. I got a, I got a decent resume, you know? Well, don't, don't like be all shy about it. Tell me about it. Okay. Well, I toured with Les Claypool from Primus. In, nice. I played in just about every single one of his solo bands. We've done records. We've done tours. Duo to Twang was the last one. We did uh, the Frog Brigade. And then I was in my own band called Merv out of San Francisco. And we had in the 90s, we were somewhat popular. We were on MTV and we toured with, you know, the t we did the tours that everybody did, went right, to sure. Europe and what haves. I uh, toured in the early 2000s with Jerry Cantrell's band, uh, Jerry from Alice in Chains. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's a decent resume. I've done That's voiceover awesome. work in movies, television, radio. Man. And I, I still did. play today, every weekend in a number of bands. My band, Kehoe International, I have another band called... Uh, the Imperial Airs with the legendary Bobby Vega, a massive bass player and a great drummer by the name of Jeff Campitelli, who was in Joe Satriani's band for 25, 30 years. So, we're, when, so you know, when you, started playing, when you started playing, did you go all when the, the earth, way back? When the earth was cooling way back then. <laughs> when, what age were you? When you decided, a, I mean, I'm assuming you had this beer since you were like seven. And yeah, I was that's the way I'm picturing beer. I mean, you. It wasn't so gray. <laughs> it wasn't so gray. I picture you just a seven year old, cool dude, like all, like just killing it and being who you are at seven years old. So when did you start playing, like seriously? And and like, were you in bands in high school? Yeah, it was like so I was 15. I was 15 okay. years old, and 
I, I just got, my head got blown up by, you know, Kiss Alive and ACDC's yep. high voltage and, yep. you know, just all that stuff. And I was like, dude, this is so rad. And I pretended to play the guitar, you know, there's picked up the broom was playing air guitar. And yep. my mom said, why don't you just take some guitar lessons? Cause you're driving me crazy with this shit. <laughs> I need the broom. I need the broom. <laughs> why don't you use that broom and clean up? Right. Start earning some money to buy your damn guitar. And then I just got bit by playing guitar. I mean, you know how that happens. I, sure. Are you a player? I'm not. And, but but I get it because honestly, the the few times I'll pick something up and kind of play around with it, it is like a feeling like you are like it's crazy how it grabs you and does that. Same thing. We have a the house drum kit here at Interstate Music, and to go every once in a while, you just go and you start playing on the drums. It just starts to suck you. And my problem is, I did not start at a young age and now I'm I feel like being in the music industry I'm so bummed that I didn't like do something with it I played saxophone in fourth grade for three weeks then I realized how heavy <laughs> that how heavy that, that fucking case was to carry yeah. across the playground to go to music lessons and I'm like it's gonna be snowing and I'm gonna be carrying a saxophone couldn't figure out how to read music couldn't make a sound. I was like not a reed instrument player. That's just hard. Like I, so, I'm, I just gave up, and then I just decided I'm gonna listen to music, and I listen to music. But I've always been all about original music, about the industry, about the um, bands and the journeys and what it takes, and the management and the promotion and the marketing of it all. And I've always just been so inspired by the creatives that when they started, how they started, what triggered them to keep doing it. Because if it seems like a true musician, like is a true musician at such a young age because they care so much deeper about getting better at such a younger age than I ever thought about getting better at anything. You know, it, like musicians are so passionate at such a young age and so driven to get better and better and better. And it's just so cool. So, I mean, did you do the whole lessons thing? And stick with I only it? did lessons. I only did lessons for uh, a couple of months, but the guitar teacher taught me how to listen to records because back in those days it was records, and you'd have to pick up the needle and put the needle on the record. Put the needle on the record, needle on the, <laughs> and the drum beat goes like this. And we'd have to learn those riffs. Yep, yep. And so I was able to learn that, and then. It was just kind of the time everybody and their dog played guitar and we all taught each other how to play guitar and we all started bands and we all just kind of got from there. And uh, I, in high school, I was in a band called Blind Illusion, which is one of the early Bay Area thrash bands. Okay. And in that band was uh, Mr. Les Claypool from Primus. And so we've been friends since Forever. high school. Right. Yeah. And so, you know. When, when, fr came, when friendships are legitimately nurtured and you've got things that you can talk about that like you shouldn't talk about that you did and all that stuff. I mean, the, those that. high school friendships are, are solid. There's <laughs> that. But, you know, it, it, and like true long-term, lifelong friends, yep. you know, there was some, there was some head button going on, you well, know, there was some stiff middle fingers going on. There was some heated arguments. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the way it goes. It is. And so you've... So what are some of the guitars that you've owned that you've loved? What's the guitar that you owned that you sold that you wish you never sold? Like, give me that a little bit. I'm a hoarder. <laughs> so I have just about everything. I immediately looked in your beard to find out if there's any of those chips. <laughs> if you're hoarding some of those chips in that beard for later. <laughs> I, have a, I have a 70s Strat that oh, weighs 27,000 pounds. It's a uh, all natural. I think it might. It's either hard ash or it's alder, but it's the clear, uh, natural color that I've had since high school, since wow. the early metal bands. And it was the only strat that uh, was allowed to be played in the band ministry. I was in. I rehearsed with ministry. I was going to do a tour, but that fell apart. But that was the only strat allowed to be played in in the band ministry, which is. <laughs> Something to say. Yeah, for sure. That's one of my favorite guitars ever. But my all-time favorite guitar 
is a, a GNL ASAT special that I bought in 1993. And it's just, it's like a piece of, it's like my, my, my right arm. It's just, I just love that guitar. And I, awesome. I, I got a shit ton of guitars all over the house. My, how many, how many guitars? I don't know, 40, <laughs> 45. <laughs> and I this, keep, I got this more is coming. Turn into a therapy session, isn't it? <laughs> I got more coming. <laughs> but you know, I got some cool shit. I got a yeah. 1973 Les Paul uh, Deluxe. It's actually uh, my father in law's. I got a 74 Martin that is beautiful. But my favorite guitar is that GNL ASAT for whatever reason. It just speaks my language. Man, and then my you've second. Got a, you've got a retirement, guitar. you've got a retirement fund in all those guitars, but you'll never sell them. No, I'm not selling. <laughs> my wife is all like, why don't you sell some of this stuff? I go, baby, it's so much easier just to press the buy now button. <laughs> I don't have to list They've it. They've made it so easy. They've made it <laughs> so easy. I don't have to ship it. I don't have to haggle. It's just buy now. Just bip, and then here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> is this still available? <laughs> yeah. It is? Buy now. <laughs> and I got, hey, I got 30 amps. Speaker cabinets. I got a whole garage full of pedals. It's insane. It's is, insane. I love that. But you, but it's you know, couple. but every single one of them, you know, probably when you bought it, why you bought it, the story behind it, and you know where every pedal is. You know all of it. Oh yeah, uh, that's the truth. And and I'm hanging on to this. What you know? Here's this rig right here. This is for when Tom Waits calls me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got my Tom Waits rig. You know what I mean? No, he's going to call. He's going to call. Well, uh, I, oh my God. I've been hanging on to that ring for 20 years, dude. I, 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 the phone's not ringing. Just doesn't know your number. For some reason, lost your number. Lost he your might. digits. He <laughs> might. If I was so, him, I'd stay away from me. That's so fantastic. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so as you, you're killing me. Uh, you're killing me, Smalls. So as, as you kind of <laughs> go through life, and you've gone through life. I can just tell. At what point did you I got start the scars? To, <laughs> at what point <laughs> did you start saying music's going to pay my bills, or I've got to find a job so music doesn't have to pay my bills because I still I want music to be my passion, not my job. Like what? At, where was that transition in timing for you? I think because there's an inconsistency I, of music paying the bills. That is the truth. And so here is the short, uh, appropriate story. Uh, I think I must have been around 18. And uh, I guess it's fair to say now since it's legal, but, you know, I was selling weed, right? To yep. subsidize sure. the gigs. And, yeah. you know, when you're a musician, you know a lot of people that smoke weed. <laughs> right. Well, well, I capitalized on that, right? I had a yeah. built-in market. So I didn't really have a real jobby job. And then I ended up just starting to tour. So we played and we toured. And, you know, I did my fair share of couch surfing. And, uh, you know, I did my fair share of living in my mom's basement. Sure. And I did a fair share of traveling around the world and playing music and meeting wonderful people and having a, a, a fantastic time. That's and awesome. And then I can still say at the ripe old age that I am of uh, 39 again <laughs> – and again, and I again. can say, <laughs> I can say that rock and roll is still paying the bills. That's amazing. And, and, and I, you know, some of the stories alone, you know, are, have got to be, you know, off the charts and fun, but I mean, what were some of the, I would say, what were some of the stories? Like, what was the most challenging time of being a musician where was there ever a time that you thought I can't just, I, I can't keep doing this. Plenty of times. And every single time, and my wife will attest to this, every time I said, I quit, I'm done, I'm quitting music, I'm going to, I don't know, be a plumber. And every out, of, single, out, of all the, uh, out of all the jobs, you go plumber? Oh, you should see my crack. I'm already built for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> But every single time I quit, I guess ever. And this is this is the God's honest truth. Every single time I quit, 
I wrote a whole new album worth of material. Like just the pressure of not even thinking about it. And then all of a sudden I yeah, played no more my writer's guitar. block. No more. You just I played my guitar more than ever. Every time I quit, <laughs> it was like, I quit. Okay. Now I don't have anything to worry about. And then all of a sudden it all came. Oh, this is, this is actually good stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I got to start playing again. I got, oh, I got God. six new bands. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to use that setup. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> So when did when did Dunlop come into your life? Other than just like gear you used. Well, the running joke that I tell around here is I I've been using this gear longer than you've owned it. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean that's what's cool about this industry and the way that you know all of it kind of forms and changes and people move around and you know, acquisitions happen and, and, and brands start and launch and all the rest of it. It's not, it's been around a long time, but sometimes some of the people that are in the music industry have been around longer and understand that journey and that story and, and, you know, tried it when it was right in the, in the early days and, and all of a sudden just started to kind of, you know, get passionate about it, start using it as one of their tools in the toolbox, so to speak. Is that it? So, so when did you start to personally like incorporate it to the point that you ended up wanting to be, you know, connected to that brand right now? Like, you what, know, what do you I'm, love? About I'm going to try to keep this is a long story. I'm going to keep it brief. Cool. I met Jimmy Dunlop, the son of the founder, Jim Sr., yep, at a bar, <laughs> at a gig. And we just hit it off. He loved our band. Our band was called Merv. And he loved our band so much. And his dad, Jim Sr., loved our band so much that they took us to Europe. And we went and we played the, like the NAM shows in Scotland and in, and in England. And it was super fun. We got back and we all just got along great. And us being from the Bay Area, yep. two of the guys being from Silicon Valley, we ended up... Um, building their first website. Okay. And then we just kept in touch. And whenever he had new stuff, R and D product development, we, we just worked out the stuff. stuff. And then I ended up being like kind of the demo monkey at, uh, at the trade shows. And then it worked into a thing. And then one day I had this idea about four months after YouTube had launched to do uh, rig rundowns, artist interviews, yep. uh, demos on videos and all that I stuff. Mean, so we I mean, and back team. then, I mean, you know, we can sit there and the generations now that are so enthralled with and, and engage with YouTube and all the rest of it and all the other social platforms. Back then, when you started to have that concept, way ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. And a ton of foresight. Now, there might have been other people doing it and this and that. But to jump on any early stages, I mean, think about the people that jumped on TikTok right when TikTok came out to start using it in a, a way to put their brand out there, et cetera. Think about what they're, where they're at now. It, it, there's so many of those things. But back then, you didn't have all these uh, opportunities to see other people did this on this platform. Other people did that. YouTube was real early on. So, it, I mean, it was, that was the wild, wild west. Like brilliant, dude. I mean, brilliant. I just thought it was a good idea, and I pitched it to Jimmy, and he was like, "Yeah, right on." And then he <laughs> said, "Why don't you just, why don't you just come and work for me?" And I go, "Okay." So really That's, long interview process, really in depth background yeah. check. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been like a salaried employee for fifteen years, but I've been working with the family doing one thing contracting with them for you know 10 years before that so i love it and know, i'm so, like a bad virus they can't get rid of me now <laughs> yeah well <laughs> we know about bad viruses lately yeah. oh, <laughs> um, oh I, too, soon, too soon too soon <laughs> too soon, too soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh sorry everybody i don't know you know i can't i'm, never, I'm not gonna be a plumber or a comedian uh yeah. so uh so what do you what do you love about Dunlop, not just the family, the vibe, because clearly you're not going to work for anybody that you're not 
all about. Like you're not, you're a person I can tell right now that if you're going to work for somebody, it's because you believe in them, you trust them, you love their mission, you love their drive, you love where they're going, and you're going to be all in in everything that you do because that's just obvious. What do you love about the product and what what it was 15 years ago when you started, even before then when you were, you know, using it just being you, and then like what it was and kind of where it's going. What what makes Dunlop something that you can stand behind and 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 be proud of? That is a very good question that has lots of very good answers. First of all, all my bosses are named Dunlop. I love the fact that it's a family owned company. It's it's technically a small business, right? Yeah. Family sure. owned small business. People see all the brands that uh, they have bought and incorporated over the years yep. and they think, yep. oh, it's some kind of, you know, it's some kind of conglomerate or some sort of investment firm. No, all my bosses are named Dunlop. It's a family owned business. Everything we can do and manufacture here in the United States, here in Benicia, California, we, we, we try to keep that manufacturing base love that. here, Yep. which I, I love that. Um, you know, if the product sucked, I wouldn't be here. But like right. I said, I've been I've been playing these products since before, you know, they owned them when Jim Senior bought MXR in the early 80s and bought Crybaby. I mean, I was playing those products. They took those products, reimagined them, brought them into the future. And Dunlop uh, them. <laughs> yeah, and Dunlop them. I mean, that's what they did. They brought in, you know, great engineers yep. that made the products solid took a solid brand and made it better. Fixed all the little, you know, the holes that were in here and the the little things there. And they, the, the other thing is that they listen to the players, not just, you know, giant rock stars and stuff like that. Listen right. to the players on what products uh, matter, how to fix the products. And it's always, uh, always working at making everything better. So. I, I love that because you know what it, it does every bit like whether whether you're trying to have a cool company culture or vibe or whatever it is having having an going through life with without blinders on you know for the people that work with you for the week, people that work for you for the consumer the people that are using or or buying your product or digesting your content whatever it is to like literally care about that outside vision because as a, you know, as a family business, I'm sure they could have just said, Hey, this is what we're doing. It's financially profitable for us, for our family business. And they could have gone that route. So many companies do. And right. it's refreshing to hear you who's not part of the family feel as though you love the fact that it is a family business. Cause a lot of people get freaked out working right. for a family business. Cause they're like, I'm only going to be able oh, to get so high. All this, sure, <laughs> sure, and we don't need to talk about those because I'm afraid no, no, to no, ask no. you because you'll probably <laughs> tell me. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to ask. You're, you're okay, welcome, good. Dunlops. <laughs> okay. So, okay, so good. it's it's one of those things where it's 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 part of the the what I love about hearing you talk about it is because I love doing business with companies that the the teams the employees the people that are out there on the front line of the of the brand feel that way about the ownership of family business and the quality of the product because for you to be there 15 years and to know honestly you could go work for anybody with your personality your resume your experience you could go work for anybody and well, I I'll love tell you this. that there's a reason you've been there for 15 years there's a lot of other people, a lot of other people that have been here longer than I have. So that that's, just says that's that a says story. Everything. That's a story to tell in and of itself. Dunlop is is clearly doing things right, and and part of that is yes, they're putting quality product out there. They're listening to people, but they're listening and caring about the people that are doing the day to day work, not just the product. So they're caring about the musicians that are using it, listening to them. They're caring about the people that work for them, and that's helping them put a quality product out there. And I love, I love to hear that because that's it. People say it, um, and sometimes you're like, mm, "Are they just saying it?" 
I, yeah. you're not you're not gonna bullshit. No, I mean, I can I'm tell not that, that right guy, now. dude. You're not. That I mean, guy. oh, I'm I'm a king bullshitter. What are you talking about? Just not <laughs> it, this time. <laughs> it's just gonna be it's just gonna be obvious at some point you're getting bullshitted by you. I mean, you're you'd be able to play me for about five to seven minutes, but on the eighth minute, I'm kind of giving you that look and being like, dude, and you're gonna be like, oh. yeah, just that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. So so what is what are some of the things that are coming down the pipeline or things that you feel have have kept Dunlop on the top of their game and what's next? Wow. Well, um I think the things that have kept Dunlop on their game is uh thinking ahead but not too far ahead. You don't okay. want to spook the herd, right? You don't want to spook the herd. Yeah. You, you, you want to be ahead, but not too far ahead. You want to listen to the marketplace. You know, we're here to make a profit. Let's not bullshit around, dude. No, you right. know, absolutely. But we want to do it with passion and purpose, right? Yep. And so we're turning over. You know, some guys are starting to age out and 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 retire, and sure. we're bringing in fresh young blood with quality ideas. And you know we've been dipping our toes in the digital market for a while now, sure. but we haven't dove in full on. I mean, because MXR has been well, MXR and Crybaby, you know, those are long-standing, established analog uh, brands, right? Yep. Right. But with the the tremolo that we just came out with a couple of years ago, the reverb, which I think is the best reverb on the market, and even though they pay me to say that. It's on my board, and I can have any damn pedal I want on my board. Yep, I love that reverb. That those are digital products, you know. And we're looking forward to to seeing how we can develop digital products that have a analog user interface, so that we can still speak the brand language sure. without spooking the bird. I mean, there's lots of pedal companies out there, and this is the golden age of boutique pedals, right? Right. I mean. There's more stuff available than ever before. And it's and it's, it's like great. the small batch bourbon. It's like the micro brews. Exactly. It's, it's it really is in that world because exactly. musicians, musicians are trying to find something that makes them different. Some a sound, a combination of sounds. Everybody wants to be themselves and express themselves. The musicians that are trying to be different just to be different aren't gonna make it. The people that are just trying to find that sound that feels right to them, that's that's where the magic is. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to say there's one other factor that to yep. that, and that's utility, right? And that yep. I think that's our that's our niche. Yep. Solid brand. Yep. Utility products that you know slash the biggest rock stars in the world can use, but you know Joe Blow at Ed's on yep. Sunday night, the meat and potato guys. Yep. that are playing covers, they want something that they know is not going to fall apart, you know? They they know that, you know, well, I've, I've had this crybaby on my pedal, on my pedal board for, you know, 10 years, and it hasn't crapped out yet. Right. You know what I mean? I've gotten uh, pictures of guys that have toured with their carbon copy, and it's just covered in blood and beer and who knows what else. And yeah. it's just... Pe pe pedals alone, it w like, there should be, like... Somebody needs to animate pedals and like create a reality TV show and let the awesome. pedals tell the story for the actual mu musicians because those awesome. pedals, those pedals have been through I think it you've all. Got something there. They've I had think some vision. Awesome. They've had some sights. They've had some like looking up at the world from a different perspective. Yeah, and, right. Uh, there's story, right? <laughs> there's That's stories. A good to be, there's stories to be told from a pedal perspective. Yeah. We're gonna you have can to take talk that and run with about that. that. You can be, All you right. can be the voice it's, of the I'm pedals. Not, you can be the I'm voice of the pedals. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I've done that. So what? Uh, what's what is next for you? What's exciting about what you've got coming down the pipeline? What What do you got cooking in the next six months, year that you're like, I'm really looking for? Whether it's personal, whether it's professional, whatever it is, what are you kind of like looking forward to? Um, you know, in, in you know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to being able to play live music more. Because I know it's still I I, I know without, that it's still without rules and restrictions where people can just 
feel like they're you know, able to just go enjoy it? I understand that this is a a, a, a trying tough. time. Yeah, it's I understand time. that it's a changing time. It's yep. not going to go back to the way it was. But you know, it. it I, I look forward to the fact that, like, because my kid's not vaccinated yet, mm -hmm. so you know, I do a lot of work with artists, and I'm not going to bring some crap home to my kid. Right. No, uh, she's my favorite person in the world. In the world, yep. I, I'm double vaxxed, and. Yep. I, I'm not going to go, and I had to turn down Guns N' Roses twice, and the Foo Fighters, and uh, you know the Black Crows, and these guys are calling me, hey, you coming to the gig? I'm all, uh, do I get to hang out? They're like, no, we're on strict lockdown. I go, well, no, I'm not going right. to go and swap spit with 20 of your favorite fans, right? unless, you know, I'll go and say, and hang out and say, hey, but, you know, you're on lockdown. I should probably not go until, you know, my daughter's safe. Right. No, I, I totally respect that. And, and, and I think I that, that miss... is, that's, that is that, that is that thing where we're all really antsy. We just got off of Summerfest here in Milwaukee and just, was that at the Eagle? Uh, no, that's at Summerfest, uh, uh, right on the lake, the outdoor music festival, oh, largest in the world. That's right. Uh, um, the Eagles ballroom connected to the rave in Milwaukee. That's a, that's a whole right. other world. But there was um, a metal fest there just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. M our sound guy, Ryan, who's helping with this podcast, shout out to Ryan back in the production studio is hey, Ryan uh, came to us from, uh, came to us from the rave, um, works for us. And then played there does, many times still does that still does the uh, side hustle. He did shine down over the, over the past weekend. Oh, nice. And so, uh, nice. so he's, he's got dudes, dude always talks about his, load in load out and uh stories uh, you know from the does rave he have, and, hey hey does he have any ghost stories that place is he, haunted, <laughs> he does have ghost stories <laughs> that place he's, is he's haunted. got all the haunted pool stories he's got all that shit is it's, scary it is that's a, it that <laughs> pedals <laughs> pedals that have been to the rave those pedals Ooh. have stories <laughs> i got them <laughs> i got them <laughs> i got plenty that's of them that's awesome that is fantastic <laughs> And and you're right. I think I think all of us are just looking to the future for us to just be able to go enjoy listening, enjoy seeing, enjoy playing for those that do in a setting that feels more like it was. I'm not saying it's going to feel like it, it was, but more comfortable where everybody's comfortable. Yeah. And and uh, man, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, got to get yeah. there. But that's what yeah. I'm looking forward to. When you ask me what am I looking forward to, that's what I'm looking forward to. So I can go and rip on my new Crybaby Junior Wah Wah pedal because wow, 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 wow. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have you on again because honestly, <laughs> legit, I just want – you need to do a video for us because I want to just – have you go through your repertoire with every pedal and just light <laughs> it up. I want, I want a I got pedal. Stories. I want a pedal workshop from you, man. We do that. We'll oh, do dude, that. I want we'll it. Just that. Special, special just for me. Just for me. No, but we're, we're set up to do that. Well, do it for me. All special right. for me. <laughs> yeah, all right. Hey, Brian. I want to thank one. you for hey, being. Listen, listen. Yeah. Uh, there's no touching in the champagne room. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, just inside, inside trader knowledge. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. Don't spend the money. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Don't spend the money. It's not a thing. Don't do it. Don't do it. Not inside, a thing. Tra inside trader knowledge. That's, <laughs> That's it. Fantastic. Brad, thanks for being part of the show. Um, Thank really you. enjoyed getting to know you. Um, clearly awesome. this is going to be my favorite podcast ever and no, no shame in everybody else that I'm, I'm going to have in the future have had in the past, but I think everybody that's been Part of the show is going to watch this podcast, listen to this podcast, and they're going to understand what I mean. Um, you're you're a ton of fun to be around. Um, someday we're going to throw down some uh, some rye together, and, oh, uh, and we're going to have a, and we're going to have a good time. And uh, I appreciate you being part of this show. And uh, you know, Interstate Music Podcast wouldn't have been the same without you, man. Right on. Thank you for inviting me. It was a blast. I enjoyed myself. And uh, you know, everybody keep picking and grinning for crying out loud, right? You got that Girl. right. This is Jeff Peterson. This is the Interstate Music Podcast. This is Brian Kehoe. We're all about Dunlop, and we're all about this podcast. We're all about you, Brian. It's all over. The podcast's over. Peterson out. Woo! <laughs>